Well, hey, good morning, Epic Church. So good to be with you today. Thank you for being here in Theater 14 at the Regal. I'm excited that you're here. I also want to say hello uh, to those of you who I know will be joining us later this week online through our website or podcast. I'm excited you're with us as well because this is an exciting time to be in our church, the life of our church. We already talked about the worship and baptism night that's coming up this Friday and what an amazing time. I'm always just so overwhelmed by the, the joy and the celebration of new life in Christ. So you don't want to miss that. Speaking of new life in Christ, I've been waiting to tell you all like all week, I've been waiting to tell you guys this, all week about some of what God did last Sunday during our Easter services. We had 10 people place their faith in Jesus for the first time. So come on, Epic Church, let's give God thanks for that today because that's really what it is all about, like helping people find Jesus and become all in followers of him. And I'm just amazed that we, that you and I get to be a part of what God is doing in our city. It's an amazing thing. Now, we already said last Sunday, we started a new teaching series called The Problem of God. And uh, it's really discussing difficult questions of faith. And it's based on a book called The Problem of God, go figure, by uh, an author called, his name is Mark Clark, a former atheist who's now a pastor in the uh, Vancouver, British Columbia area. And it's a very helpful book. Uh, I really have enjoyed it. And I would encourage you, I would recommend it to you to pick up a copy. In fact, if you don't have a copy next Sunday, we will have more here for you to purchase at our information center out in the lobby. We had like 40 some copies last week and you guys just snatched them up, which is great. I'm glad that you went after those and you grabbed those. So we've got ordered some more this week. They'll be here next Sunday and you can grab your copy then. Also, speaking of next Sunday, on the back side of your message notes, uh, there's, uh, you can see where we're headed in this series. And if you look at that next Sunday, it's not a typo. Like, we are going to be talking about the problem of sex, all right? And so, like, because God doesn't have a problem with sex. Let me just make that clear. Like, he's not, like, he created it, and he thinks it's good. But some people think that God has a problem with sex, that he's anti-sex, and that what he's put down in scripture, the guidelines he's put there are somehow old-fashioned. And so next Sunday, we're going to be talking about, like, why does God have those guidelines? And why does he have a particular context for sex? So I want to make sure you have a heads up on that, especially for you parents. Like, we're, it's not going to be awkward or anything. Like it's not going to be like having the talk with your kid or something like that. Okay, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be appropriate, but it is going to be honest. And so we just wanted you to be aware of that so that you can process that with your kids next week. But today we are talking about the problem of science, which science is a huge subject. Like, there, like even if they didn't start showing movies in here at 12.30 p.m., there would not be enough time to talk about all the issues that people have with faith and science. And so I'm not even going to try to talk about all the issues. It's going to kind of be a, a summary today. And, and so we're going to be looking at some different things today. And I know that for some of us, like science eh, is kind of a subject that we're like, meh. Like we appreciate its advancements in technology and medicine, but to think about it as a topic of discussion, boring, no thank you. No one need that today. And then there's some of us here who are like, we really dig science. Like, where are my science fans at today? A few people. All right, cool. You're like, you're like my kids. My kids love science. It's one of their favorite subjects. And they like to do experiments, like experiments. This is what I'm talking about when I say experiments. Like they like to do the they like to do the baking soda and vinegar volcano thing. Maybe you know this one, but they like to add other stuff to it. Like maybe some food coloring, or hey, hey, here's some flour. Let's dump that in there, or some sugar, or hey, chocolate sauce. Who doesn't like chocolate sauce? Let's put some of that. I mean, I think anything that's in powder or liquid form that's in our kitchen has ended up in one of their experiments before. And the best part is when they do some experimenting without us knowing. Like they're eight and 10 and they, I've, I've, like I've found, I've, my kids have like, they've put experiments in the freezer. I found them in there. I found them in the bathroom. And sometimes our kitchen just looks like a bomb went off. My eight-year-old daughter, like she loves to make perfume with flower petals and I think hand lotion and who knows what else is in there. So they like to do this kind of, and I just love their outlook because they just kind of like dump stuff together and have the faith that science will turn out. That's kind of their MO. But I know for a lot of us here today, like, Faith and science are a little more complicated than that, isn't it? It's a little more complicated than that. Some of us here, like we are all in followers of Jesus. We have a strong faith, but we know that it seems like there's some contradictions between faith and science, and we don't know what to do with that. And we're kind of wondering, like, is it possible to believe in both faith and science? Is, is that even allowed? Like, I don't know. And then there's some of us here who, like, we would say we have faith in Jesus, but we just, maybe we don't believe quite everything in Scripture or kind of like everything around Jesus. We go, I don't know about that. And so maybe on this topic, when it comes to faith and science, we say, well, I'm going to choose science over that because I just think it's a little more reliable or something like that. Well, then there's some of us here today, like, you know, we, we used to have a pretty strong faith at one time. 
Um, but if we're honest, like some doubts and, and, and some, some questions came in because of some things that happened in our life. And so we're like, you know what? Like, I don't really even care about faith and science today. Like, because I feel like God let me down. And I understand that. And then there's some of us here today who probably would say, like, we're kind of a, a little skeptical. Maybe you're like, I don't even know how someone can really believe in God because hasn't science, like, hasn't it proven he doesn't exist? So like, all kinds of different viewpoints we can have. And I don't know which one you might have, but here's what I think. I think that no matter where you're at, that there'll be something today that will help you see it differently than you've seen it before and when you came in today. So we're going to be looking at some different things about science, some, some myths I'm going to call them, because I think that we typically think that, that science and, and, and faith don't get along, like that they're enemies, and, and that, that we really can't, they can't coexist. But I just wonder, is that really the case? Or is that just what we've been led to believe? So go ahead and grab your message notes. We're going to take a look at four different myths today. And as we go through these, I, I want to encourage you to do three things. And the first thing is to keep an open mind. Just try to keep an open mind. Just listen and, and try to engage your mind and see where this is going to go. Um, second thing would be to, to just kind of hang on. <laughs> like it might, might feel a little academic sometimes today as we go through some of these myths. And I'll just encourage you to hang on. We'll get through it. And then the third thing would be, would be this, would be honest. Just be honest with yourself this morning. And if you think that faith and science are enemies, why? Like why do you think that? Like maybe, maybe you're believing one or more of these myths. So four myths about faith and science. Here's the first one. Go ahead and write this in. Faith is anti-intellectual. Faith is anti-intellectual. In other words, if you're going to have faith, then you got to check your brain at the door. Like you just got to park that thing back there. And I know that's the image of faith that gets popularized in, in media. Like that's kind of a popular image of faith in, in, in media. But some of you have had experience with other churches where there's not a whole lot of room for faith, in faith for like knowledge and reason. It's all experiential and, and, and emotional. And so, but here's the thing I want you to understand. That's a very, very small percentage of the Christian church, of Christian faith. If you look at the 2000 year history of the church, what you will find, what you will see is that followers of Jesus have always engaged their minds. They've always pursued knowledge with their faith. In fact, did you know that the university, academia, is a 12th century invention of the church, of Christians? Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Dartmouth, all of those schools were started as Christian institutions. Now, I'm not smart enough to go to any of those schools, Okay, but I did spend nine years in undergrad and graduate level work. And to prove it, there's a picture coming up of uh, Lisa and I, my wife, uh, on, on my, uh, my graduation from seminary. Just to prove it, like, look how young we look. My wife actually looks the same, I think. Um, but I definitely look a little younger there. But she's got a big smile on her face. You know why? Because I did the unbelievable feat of cramming three years of seminary into four. And she's like, finally, he's done. Like, we can get on with life. Like, this is over. So she was happy about that. But all nine years of my study was at Chris, Christian institutions. And I can tell you, like, we didn't just sit around holding hands and singing Kumbaya. No, like, we worked hard. And we read thousands of pages and, and wrote hundreds, if not thousands, of papers. And, and like we had really intelligent discussion and, and deep thinking and debating going back and forth. And I had brilliant men and women as professors who were not afraid of science or deep thinking. And they didn't teach us to be afraid of it either. And you know who else didn't teach us that? Jesus didn't teach us to be that way. And, and it's not in your notes, but in Matthew chapter 22, uh, verse 37, Jesus said that we are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. We're supposed to engage our mind when it comes to getting to know God. And so this idea that if you want to have faith, you just got to park your brain at the door, like, it's simply not true. So that's, that's the first myth. Here's the second one. Science is objective while faith is subjective. So science is objective. It means it's unbiased, that it's mostly based on facts. Like if we just follow the trail of evidence, we'll get to the truth. Where, where faith is, you know, a little more subjective, based on opinions, a little bias in the way it's applied. And part of the reason why I think we believe this about science is because in elementary school, we learned about the scientific method. Remember the scientific method? Hopefully you didn't bring up some bad memories for you this morning. And if you don't remember that, like, what is that again? I kind of vaguely remember. There's a, a picture coming up that outlines the scientific method. It's basically this, like you see something happen, you go, hmm, I wonder why that happened. And so you form a guess, a hypothesis to say, well, this is why I think this happened. And then you conduct an experiment 
to see if that's the case, to test your hypothesis. And then you write down what happened, whether it was right or wrong. And then you share your results with other people. Scientific method. And I don't know about you, but I hated this when I was in elementary school. Like, I mean it. Like, I would look at this and say, why do we have to do this? Like, surely someone else already did this experiment. Why can't we just read about their results and learn that way? Then we wouldn't have to clean up this mess. Like, that was my outlook. Maybe you were the same way, maybe you were not. But we've all had this experience with the scientific method that says, oh, well, science just always follows the facts to where it goes. But that's not always true. Like, there is theory and there's interpretation in science. Take, for example, the, the theory of evolution. Now, I'm not going to try to knock on it or anything like that. I'm just going to objectively look at it, okay? The theory of evolution is a theory that says, it tries to explain observable data, things that we can see, but sometimes it's not repeatable. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take the fossil record. Okay, let's take the fossil record. In the fossil record, at different periods of time, we have these species that are totally different from other species at a later date. And so the question is, well, how, how did they come about? Where did these species come from? And the theory is, the belief is that, well, they, they evolved from one to the other. Now, a couple of things with that, just again, being unbiased. In the fossil record itself, there's no evidence of that. There is no evidence anywhere of gradually transforming species from one kind to another. In the fossil record, it's just, here's one kind, total, complete, and then boom, here's another one. So you would think that at some point there would be evidence of gradual transformation. The other thing is, is as a theory, like we can't go back and test our hypothesis on this because it was too long ago. There's nothing we can do. We can't go set up an experiment to see, did this really happen? And so between what can be proven and what we think, there's this gap. And that gap is bridged by theory, by belief, by interpretation of what happened. And that's okay. That's what theory is. I mean, that's, theory is everywhere in life, but we have to realize that science doesn't always just follow the facts. There's, there's some guesswork involved. Any scientist will tell you that, that it's open to interpretation. Some will say, well, we think this, and others will say this, and others will say, well, we think this is how it happened, and that's, that's totally okay. Totally okay. And by the way, we don't have time to like, talk about how faith is objective, but I, I just want to say this real quickly. I wish we had time, but we don't. But if you think, well, faith is never objective in its application, well, what about the fact that we're moral beings? What about the fact that we have a deep sense of right and wrong, that we have a sense of justice? Like, where does that come from? If it's all about survival of the fittest, then it doesn't matter if I take your food and take your mate. Sorry, man, strongest wins. Why should you care? Sorry. So where does that come from? Or like the fact that there's design all over creation, like intricate, complex design that screams out, for a designer. So faith can be applied objectively as well. So let me just pause real quick. How are you doing so far? Like maybe if you're like me, your brain's starting to get a little full. Like you're like, oh man, where is this going? Hang in there. All right, hang in there. We're almost through these myths. In fact, here's the third one. Okay, the third myth. Go ahead and write this in. Science answers questions that faith cannot. Science answers questions that faith Cannot. And this myth kind of builds off the previous one. It holds the assumption that, that, that faith is limited because it's, you know, primarily opinions and feelings. So if you really want to get to the truth of things, you've got to use science. Well, okay. I'll admit that faith can't explain everything to me. Like, for example, I don't need faith to tell me how the chemical reaction in photosynthesis in plants happens. But science has limits, too. Science has limits, too. And one thing it's limited on is it cannot prove or disprove either way God's existence or that he created everything. And scientists themselves will admit this. Harvard professor Stephen J. Gold, he, he was probably the most celebrated uh, atheist and evolutionary uh, biologist and pathologist of the last generation, I'm uh, sorry, paleontologist of the last generation. And it frustrated him that people tried to use science, other scientists and atheists tried to use science to disprove faith. He's like, you, you can't do that. Look at what he said. Look at this quote. To say it for my colleagues and for the umpteenth million time, Science simply cannot, by its legitimate methods, adjudicate or prove the issue of God's possible superintendence of nature. We neither affirm nor deny it. We simply cannot comment it on it as scientists. So here is this world-renowned scientist, an atheist, arguing with his colleagues. Remember, this guy doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe God created everything, but he says, science can't get you there. We can't answer that question. And there you know, are very, there are several questions, actually, around evolution theory that really don't have a clear answer. For example, how did non-living chemicals and elements become living cells? And how did living cells randomly assemble into intelligent beings like animals and humans? And what about this one? If there's no moral God behind all the universe, if it's all just about survival of the fittest, 
then why do you and I care about anything? Like, we don't need that for survival. It's just about food, reproduction, safety. Like, why do we care? Why do we love? Why do we create art? Why, when we see someone in danger or even an animal in danger, there's something in us that might even put ourselves at risk to go and help? Or why is it when we have two or three coats and we see someone without one, there's something in us that says, I wanna, I wanna give that to someone. Like, like even if, chem, like, why, why would chemistry lead to that? Like, isn't there someone behind all of this, directing all of that? So all that to say that, that science isn't the be-all, end-all, that some people wanna make it out to be. And then here's the last myth, If you're taking notes, go ahead and write this in. If I believe in science, I can't believe in God. If I believe in science, I cannot believe in God. And I think many of us wrestle with this one. Like maybe we were reading some books or reading online and we started like, I don't know, like this person says that and that person says that and I don't know what to believe anymore about this. Or maybe you went to high school or college and it was a teacher who who, who just like was so convincing that they cannot coexist. Like I know for me, that was my 10th grade biology teacher so adamant that faith and science cannot exist together that I I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna have to leave science behind. I don't want to, but like, I can't leave God behind because he's too real in my life. And so I guess I'll just build a little wall around science. Like, I know that's not the right thing to do, but I'll just kind of put it over because I don't really know what to do with it because I can't really coexist. And maybe some of you feel like that too, that it's science versus faith that they can't get along, but it doesn't have to be that way. And most scientists don't believe that either. In 2009, Pew Research Center did a poll of scientists and faith. Look at what they found out. 51% of scientists believe in some form of deity or higher power. 51%, the majority. 41% of scientists do not believe in any type of God. They're they're atheists. So that's actually the minority, right? And then there's 7% of scientists who would just say, I don't know if there's a God or not. They would be agnostic. And then get this, of the 51% who believe in some form of higher power, some form of God, 33%, a full third of all scientists believe in a personal God. Isn't that amazing? So you see, the truth is that science leads many researchers toward faith as much as it leads them away from it. And a perfect example of this is Alan Rex Sandage. He was Edwin Hubble's assistant, Edwin Hubble made the Hubble telescope, probably heard of that before. He was his assistant. And Sandage is regarded as one of the most influential astronomers of all time. Not just in his generation, but of all time. And as a boy, he would have said, yeah, I was pretty much an atheist. I didn't believe there was a God. But as he started to study science, look at where it led him. Look at this quote. It is my science that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than can be explained by science. It was only through the supernatural that I can understand the mystery of existence. And if you read stuff about him, you, you'll find that science actually led him toward God that in his 50s, he placed his faith in Jesus. So you see, it doesn't have to be science or faith. It can be science and faith. And that's the bottom line for today. That's the thing that I hope you really kind of take from this is that, that faith and science are not enemies, but friends. Faith and science are not enemies, but friends, and what that means is that science should take faith seriously and faith should respect science. Like they're friends, they should get along because we need both of them. Like science asks the how question, how did this happen? But faith asks the why. Why did this happen and and who? Who did all of this? And I would argue that that's really the whole point of scripture to tell us the who and the why. I mean, think about it. Scripture tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. And I'll admit, it's not very specific on the how. And maybe we would like it to be. Maybe we'd like it to be more specific about how God did that because it's interesting. I get that. I understand that. But even if we fully understood all of the how, how everything happened, we would still wonder who and why because it's the who and the why that gives us meaning and purpose to our life. And so God's intention was really that our observation and our exploration of his creation would lead us to him all along. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter one. By the way, Paul was a very important leader in the early church, uh, traveled the known world at the time, uh, sharing about Jesus and, and wrote most of the New Testament. And here he's writing to followers of Jesus in the city of Rome. And look at what he says in chapter one, verse 20. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, 
so that people are without excuse. So in other words, science is one of the ways that we can look into creation and learn more about God. I mean, God's constantly calling us through what he's made, like the stars and the trees and phytoplankton. Like he's all saying, hey guys, look, like this points to me. This is what this is about. Here I am, seek me. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So the problem, Paul says, is not a lack of evidence about God's existence, but the fact that we are willing to ignore it and believe something else. So what about you, Epic Church? Where are you at right now with all of this? I mean, you don't have to answer out loud or raise your hand or anything like that, but are you starting to see how faith and science can be friends, that they can get along and that they can coexist? I mean, can you see that? I mean, hopefully, I hope you can, but if not, I want you to know that's okay. Like, if you're still feeling a little skeptical, if you're still wondering, like, how does this all work out? Because, you know, I don't know. I want you to know that's okay because this is a big thing and we really do need to engage. I'm not just asking you to, like, just... Like, I'm not asking you to park your brain at the door today. I'm asking you to engage your mind. Think about these things with an open mind. Consider it. Because maybe they could be friends. I believe they can. But I can't help but wonder if maybe, just maybe, maybe the reason why you're holding on to your skepticism is because you don't really know what I mean by faith. Because let's be honest, there are some really weird ideas out there about faith. Like the idea that if I put my hand into a box of rattlesnakes and pull one out, it won't bite me if I have enough faith. I mean, how, would you, how many of you would like to try that today? Like, here's a box of rattlesnakes, everybody. I don't have a box. I mean, like, come on. Like, that, that's not faith. That's dumb. <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. But, but seriously, what is faith? What is faith? Because it's important that we know what it is because it is the foundation and basis of a relationship between us and God. So, so what is faith? Well, here's what I want to do in the time we have left. I want to quickly give you two thoughts about faith. And the first one is this. Go ahead and write this in. Faith is not blind. Faith is not blind. And as you write that in, take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. There in your notes. And go ahead and read it out loud with me so I know you're with me today, okay? Here we go. You ready? Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, some of you say, wait a second. That kind of, what do you mean? Like, no, stick with me. Circle that word certain, okay? Just circle that word certain for me because that's an important word in this verse. And here's what it means. It means conviction. It means to to be made satisfied with evidence. So imagine a courtroom for a moment. You see the jury and the judge and the accused and the attorneys. Imagine someone maybe being on trial for murder. What is it that's going to convict that person of murder? The evidence. Right, the evidence. And it's the same with faith. Faith is not some blind leap into the dark. It's not just believing something without having a reason to. No, there is evidence for our faith. And we don't have time to go into all of the evidence. But for example, did you know that there are over 25,000 copies, accurate copies of the original writings of the New Testament? That's more than Homer, Plato, and Caesar combined. And yet no one doubts that those writings are accurate. There is no other ancient writing that has more accurate copies than the New Testament. And we can trust that they're accurate because of the painstaking process that we know of that they went through to copy them down. And there's other things we could talk about in the, in the realm of archaeology and stuff like that. We don't have time. But here, to me, is the most convincing evidence. It's the best and most convincing is, is the eyewitness testimony of the first followers of Jesus. And hold on a second. We know how eyewitness testimony is. Well, let me, let me talk, talk about these eyewitnesses for a second. They were the ones who spent the most time with Jesus, who saw the things that he did, who heard the things that he said. They were the ones who saw him when he had risen from the dead. I mean, they saw him die on the cross and then three days later saw him alive. And they didn't believe it at first either. But then they became convinced as Jesus spent time with them over 40 days that it was really him, that he was really alive. And we can trust their witness because they were willing to be imprisoned and persecuted and tortured and put to death. Listen, nobody dies for something that's not true. And if eventually it would have been found to be untrue, they would have left it, but they didn't. They stuck with it because they knew it was true. And that is convincing. So ultimately then, what is faith? What is faith? Faith is a choice to trust. And if you're taking notes, go ahead and write that in. Faith is a choice to trust. 
And we make these kind of choices every day. Every single one of you, when you walked into the theater today, made a faith choice, whether you realize it or not, when you sat down. Like you didn't, I didn't see any one of you when you came in, like pulling out something to test the load weight of the chair. Like you just said, no, it'll hold me. No one's checking to make sure the chair's level with the floor. You didn't even check to see if it was broken. You just put the seat down and sat down, didn't you? You just had faith it would hold you up. And even if that chair would have broken under you in that moment, it wouldn't have been like, oh, chairs are not trustworthy. I can never trust a chair again. I will never sit down in my life because that chair broke. No, you would still trust the chairs are going to hold you up. And so every day we make these choices of faith. And I know, I understand that trusting a chair is totally different than trusting God because we have to trust God with some pretty big things. And for some of us today, it's the science thing. That's the thing that's always kind of hung us up. But maybe today you can see that, hey, faith and science are friends. And that doesn't have to be in your way anymore. For others of you, though, I know it's because of something that happened in your life that's caused doubt and, and, and questions to come in, like, where is God? I mean, maybe your marriage fell apart. Or maybe your mom or your dad got sick. Maybe you lost your job or you lost your place in your degree program, or, or maybe you've been trying to start a family and there's no baby yet. Or maybe you had a tragedy happen to you, or you know someone that's, uh, that's close to you had a tragedy or some kind of abuse happened to you, and you just kind of, you look around at your life and you say, um, all I see is bad. And I know God's supposed to be for me and with me and work things for my good, but I just see bad stuff and it just feels like God is absent. So Ray, how am I supposed, how am I supposed to trust now? I understand that. And when I was a, a student ministries pastor at another church, there was a girl in our youth group. Her name was Drea. And Drea had already successfully battled cancer as a middle school student. And then as a high school student, after a series of, of things, it was discovered that she had a brain AVM, which is uh, this kind of tanglement of, of veins in your brain that kind of acts like a, 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 an aneurysm. It was there probably from the moment she was born, like it probably developed in utero. And so if they didn't take care of it, the chances were that it could burst and cause a brain bleed and maybe a stroke or, or a severe brain damage. So they had to go in there and take care of it. And it's kind of interesting, like how they take care of it. They kind of go up through your neck and the veins and they basically shoot glue to seal those vessels off so that blood can't get through them. And during her procedure, they accidentally perforated one of the veins and caused a brain bleed, the exact thing they were trying to avoid, and she went into a coma. And the doctors weren't sure if she was gonna wake up, and if she did, like, how severe it was gonna be. And Dre and her parents, uh, they were all in followers of Jesus, and I remember sitting there with Paula and Joe in that hospital, and I remember Joe, like, weeping and saying, like, my... My faith must be weak because my mind is just filling up with doubts. And another pastor who was there with us, he said, Joe, I believe, help my unbelief. And those words that he said, they were originally said by another dad who was feeling a lot like Joe. This dad's son was demon possessed, had been for a long time. He brings his son to Jesus' his disciples and they can't do anything about it. And so then they come to Jesus and look at what it says, the last verse, and you know, it's Mark chapter nine, verse 22. He says to Jesus, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Can you hear the desperation in his voice? And Jesus says, if you can, and I just want to pause there for a moment because I think sometimes if we're familiar with this, like we read, I think Jesus was kind of insensitive. Like, don't you trust me? No, I think he was just trying to give that dad a pause for a moment. Say, if I can, if I can. Everything is possible for the one who believes. So you're going to choose to believe or not, Dad. What are you going to do? And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my belief. And I'm glad to say today that Drea did wake up. She had pretty much a full recovery. She's married with two kids. But I will never forget that powerful moment in that hospital waiting room, as we prayed together, I believe, help my unbelief. And I can't tell you how many times in my own life if I've, as I've faced doubts and questions about what is God up to and where is he and how is this gonna turn out, how many times I've come back to that same prayer, God, I believe, help my unbelief. So what about you, Epic Church? 
Where in your life do you need to place your trust in Jesus? Where in your life have you been finding it difficult to trust in him? Look, doubts are normal. They're gonna happen. They don't go away when you come to faith. You're gonna have questions. You're gonna be wondering what God's up to. But Jesus can help you overcome those doubts with belief if you place your trust in him today. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be here today and we can talk about these big subjects and try to think them through that you've given us minds to engage you with and that we shouldn't be afraid of deep thinking or of science or anything else. And God, I pray for for those who might be here today who might be a little skeptical and I, I just pray you'd open their hearts and their minds to what could be, what can be, what is, that faith and science are friends and that if they just engage their mind and are open-minded about it, they could see that. So help them to, to be led to that today, God, to let those, those, um, those doubts to, to fall away as they look at you and they look at how these two things work together. And Father, for those of us who already have a strong faith, I pray that you just help us to be sensitive, especially when it comes to this topic, because, man, some mean things get said and done to people when they have a difference of opinion. And I just think that we're supposed to be loving and show love. And so we should give some grace as people try to work through this. I also wanna pray, Father, for those who are here today who need help in overcoming unbelief, whatever it is they might be facing. God, help them just to turn back to you, no matter how far they've turned from you, to turn back to you and to place their faith in you once again and to just cry out, God, I believe. Help me to trust you. Help me to overcome my unbelief. And finally, Father, for those of us who have not yet like even started that faith relationship with you, that as we think and and, and listen today, we realize that like we don't have a faith relationship with you at all. And maybe it was science that was hanging us up or maybe it was something else. But like as we sang songs today and as we prayed and as we listened to your word and to these thoughts and ideas, like it was like, hey, you know what? Like there's really nothing keeping me from placing my faith in Jesus to be the savior and Lord of my life. Like, I believe that, Jesus, you are who you said you are. And I don't understand how it all happened or where it's all gonna go, but I wanna place my faith in you and I wanna bridge that gap that is there because of my sin, the gap that you died for, saved me from, but then rose again so that I could have life. So if that's you today, I just pray that you would be able to say these words in your heart or mind. It's not about the perfect prayer or getting it right, but just say something like this in your own heart today. Father, I believe in you. I believe in your son. I believe in your Holy Spirit. And I know that I need you in my life. And so I call out to you, thanking you, Jesus, that you died, were buried and rose again so that I could be forgiven and set free and have life, a new life in you for as many days as I have left. And I invite you into my heart, into my life. And with your help, I will follow after you and go all in for you. Father, we thank you for the life change, for the changes of mind that are represented here this morning. We thank you for all that you're doing and that we get to be a part of it. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and everyone who agreed said, amen, amen.